Our epistle reading for this morning comes to us from 1 Peter chapter 1 and is our text for our sermon. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. What guides your life? Maybe it's your calendar or your budget, your goals, maybe your passions. But what's the very first thing you open on your phone in the morning? Stephen Covey is known for saying, live your life by a compass, not a clock. But what kind of compass? That's hard for me to hear the word compass and not uh, bring to my mind the, the image of the compass that was owned by the great fi- famous pirate Captain Jack Sparrow. Right? For those of you who have seen the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, you know that this pirate captain has this compass that does not point to magnetic north. But it doesn't mean it's missing any value. You see, this compass points to whoever the holder values or longs for the most, whether it be a location or a person or a a bottle of rum. Now, this is especially helpful when you want to define the location of your greatest desire, your biggest passion. And this earth gives us all sorts of earthly passions about which we can be hyper-enthusiastic. And by following our passions, that can quickly lead to being shaped or conformed by them. And today in our text, Peter warns us not to be conformed to the passions of our former ignorance. Now this word passion can be translated as something a love and a desire, or even a lust for something that is forbidden. A mind and a heart that is troubled or stressed, overwhelmed, fearful, doubtful, hopeless, or hurting, rather than turning to the grace of God to bring healing and hope, turns to escape, seeking relief at the bottom of a bottle or any number of other chemicals or behaviors. And it's a cloudy-headed mind that finds escape in intoxication, and it's nothing more than idolatry. But now many of us can take passions on more socially acceptable forms, right? We can be passionate about many good things in our life, education or marriage or family, career or social justice. Now, steeped deeply in New Age thinking, Deepak Chopra suggested it would be helpful if the universe would give us one big clue or a giant compass, if you will, pointing to the direction that we should be taking. In fact, he continues, the compass is there. To find it, you only need to look inside of yourself to discover your soul's purest desire, its dream for your life. And see, what he misses is that even making good things the ultimate things, elevating them to the status of God, replaces God. Those things then become our source of happiness and security and ultimately result in unhappiness and insecurity. See, I think that we are guilty of using Jack Sparrow's compass when we fix our minds on those things that we are passionate about what do we fix our minds on what do we think about a lot what do we focus on 
Maybe it's our next meal, our next drink, our next relationship, our next job, our next fill in the blank. See, our earthly appetites are insatiable. Or rather, it's maybe more important to think that these earthly appetites, they just, these earthly offerings cannot satisfy this divine appetite that we all have. That we hunger for God, but look for Him in all of the wrong places, trying to find satisfaction by earthly pleasures. And given time, our passions take control of our lives. If the alcoholic isn't already buzzing, they're thinking about their next drink. The workaholic is constantly concerned with what still needs to be done and how others perceive the quality of work that they've already accomplished. The person bound to the most recent news cycle finds their emotions bound to the state of the world as described by the work of their favorite dealer. I mean, broadcaster. Thanks for getting that one. Our passions demand our time, our energy, our focus, and they mold and shape us to the patterns of this world. Peter uses this word, conformed. And being conformed is easy, and it's difficult to recognize when it happens slowly, bit by bit, over a large amount of time. But the consequences can be severe. The alcoholic waking up with no memory of their actions the night before. The spouse of a workaholic who recognizes that they live in a loveless and empty marriage without any type of intimacy. Or maybe closer to home, a lifelong Christian who has become comfortable and complacent in the gospel, free to live however they'd like to, knowing that Jesus will forgive them after anyways. Held captive by our passions, all of us need to be ransomed. And the only one who can ransom us, deliver us from our worldly passions, of course, is Jesus. This word ransom, it's a very special word, and Peter knows what it's like to be ransomed. He knows what it's like to feel ransomed. Now, this is Peter the disciple writing this letter, writing this letter after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, after his betrayal of Jesus. On that night when he betrayed Jesus, three times and the rooster crowed. When Jesus looked at Peter with disappointment and knowing. That's the that guilt, that pit of the stomach kind of guilt that Peter knew all too well. That then one day after the resurrection, after the disciples have been fishing, Jesus invites the disciples to the shore for a fish breakfast, which I can't quite wrap my head around. And he pulls Peter aside. And one time after another, after another, Jesus asks this ransoming question to Peter, who feels very much on the outside at this point in time. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. You see, Peter, he was was conformed by the world and pursuing this fearful passion on that night when he betrayed Jesus. And he was held captive by that fear. And he needed to be ransomed, purchased back. And in that fish breakfast, it's exactly what Jesus reminded Peter of, that not only did Jesus still passionately love Peter, but he had a purpose for Peter's life. He ransomed him from this fear and brought him into a newness of life. 
Jesus would not give up on Peter and Jesus will not give up on you. Jesus ransoms us from our futile ways, our passions. And speaking from experience in more ways than just one, I know that any number of chemicals and behaviors can become addictive. I know that it feels like those chemicals and behaviors can be a quick fix. Far easier and faster than investing in a relationship with God. But yet it is the gospel of Christ, the sacrifice that he made on the cross that truly causes our cup to overflow, our hearts to be awakened and find a certain and living hope and a peace that passes all understanding. God and God alone can satisfy our divine appetites and make our cups overflow. Knowing that you are ransomed from the feudal ways, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, Peter writes, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. See, our ransom was not purchased with something so simple as currency, but with the very body and blood of Christ, the blood of the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, this precious blood, blood that carries our life force. It delivers necessary oxygen and fuel throughout our bodies. No blood, no life. Lose enough blood, you will lose your life. And for our sake, Jesus was wounded and his blood was spilt. His blood is our sin covering. His blood brings his death, but it gives us life. This blood that we receive in the Lord's Supper, his very real presence, not just a memorial meal, but the actual blood of our Savior. We interact with, we engage with, we receive. A grace that's so real that we can taste it. The precious blood of Christ is imperishable, just like our inheritance is imperishable. This is the preciousness of the ransom paid for us. And the Son of Man came, has, came to give His life as a ransom for many. And remembering that we have been ransomed, we are to be what Peter calls sober-minded with minds that are prepared for action. Sober-minded. For those of you who are struggling with sobriety of any kind today, I want to let you know it's hard work, but it's worth it. A sober mind takes effort. Extraordinary effort along with divine help, but it is more than worth it. Now, I'm not going to suggest today that everybody give up alcohol. But if there's any chemical or any behavior in your life that is controlling you, then your mind is far from being sober. You're turning to a shadow of healing and missing out on not only the richness of the grace found in Christ, but also the transformed life of freedom, joy, sacrifice, and renewal that God has waiting for you. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. You see, the opposite of being dulled by alcohol or any other addictive behavior or chemical, the opposite of that is being filled by the Holy Spirit, who sharpens and intensifies our awareness. Be sober-minded. And then Peter says, be prepared. Be prepared in your mind for action. He says, having girded up the loins of your mind. Now, girding up the loins refers to the long flowing robes that everybody typically wore. Now, it would be absolutely ridiculous for me to attempt to run in this. And so, to gird up the loins meant to, to gather up all of the folds and, and layers of your robe and tuck them into your belt so that you could run more freely, be ready at the moment's notice to take off, be prepared for action. Paul, Peter says this is how your minds should be. Prepare your minds for action. 
Instead of letting your thoughts or your purposes or your decisions just hang loosely around you while you move leisurely through life as impulse and occasion may move you, instead, Peter says to his readers and his listeners today, get ready for action. Getting ready for action means motivation. Just like an athlete prior to a big event gets their mind ready for what's about to happen. Maybe listen to some pump-up music. If you're in my generation, you remember jock jams. And it gets your mind ready. We also did this thing called visualization sometimes. And in cross-country, the Friday before a Saturday meet, we would all go into a quiet place with our eyes closed and we would imagine the race. And our coach, who also happened to be my dad, which is just really tough, would describe the race from the feeling that we would have in our guts right before the gun went off to the start, to the beginning of the race, talking us through each curve and turn and hill and valley all the way to the finish so that we could see in our minds what that would be like. In my sermon prep this week, I couldn't help but think about worship as that exact moment, right? That what we do right now is, in fact, a part of getting our minds prepared for action, right? We are, we are focusing on the Word of God, receiving His sacraments, praising Him with our voices, celebrating together the grace and goodness of God, getting ready for the week ahead, this isn't just something we come and do as, as just our regular protocol. This is preparation day for the rest of our life and the week to come to get our minds straight, to focus on what really matters, to center our heart, not on our worldly passions, but on the passion of Christ to get ready for action. Prepare our minds for action. I can't encourage you enough to begin every single day with word and prayer. If you don't already do so, set your clock 10 minutes early and wake up and, and spend just a few minutes in Scripture and a few moments in prayer before the rest of your day starts. Now, if you already do this, then start it 15 minutes, half an hour earlier, and increase it. Grow in it. I conducted a little bit of an experiment this past week. I've been setting my clock earlier and earlier so that I can have more time in prayer and, and study of God's Word prior to even jumping in the shower and getting ready for the day to set my mind, get it ready for action, to be sober-minded. And one day I thought, I'm going to experiment and not do it. Because surely, an extra 45 minutes of sleep is a good thing. That was the worst day of my week. My mind wasn't straight. It wasn't prepared for action. It was responding to whatever trial and tragedy or trauma was happening in that moment. Rather than being centered and fixed on Christ. You see, when you begin your day in this way, focusing on His Word, receiving the voice of God in your life, sharing your thoughts and your heart with Him in prayer, it prepares your mind for action. You gird up those long robes of your flowing creativity and you focus them laser sharp on what really matters. And you experience transformation. See, this is what happens when you are sober-minded with your mind prepared for action. God begins to work incredible transformations in your life. Paul writes this to Rome, do not be conformed to this world, the same word that Peter uses in our text today, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, the good and acceptable and perfect will. See, when you are ransomed by Jesus, you are given a sober mind that is prepared for action. And it results in a life of transformation. Now, sometimes this transformation is instantaneous. 
But often in my life, I've seen it be slow and steady, constantly progressing over a lot of hard work over a long time. Peter writes, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. You see, we are to keep those Ten Commandments not out of fear or fear of punishment, but because of a transformed life of freedom, because Jesus has already fulfilled that law in our place and, by our, and, and for our sake so that we have this freedom to do our best at living it. Not out of fear of punishment, but out of a joy that comes in doing so. You see, God gives us the Ten Commandments not to to limit or reduce or restrict our lives, but that we would encounter the best life imaginable this side of heaven, that we would be a part of making His kingdom come as we do our best to reshape and reform our little tiny corner of creation. In doing so, we are transformed. I'd like you to think this week about what it is that you are driven by. What passions in your life may be seeking to enslave or ensnare you? What Jesus has done to ransom you? And how you can work this week to be sober-minded with a mind that's prepared for action. And may that bring you a strength and a courage and a peace that passes all understanding in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our weekly awakening question, this thought that we have for you to ponder and share with those around you is this, from what passion has God ransomed you? From what passion has God ransomed you?